Thanks for coming on the program. I really do appreciate you uh, being here. Yeah, thank you so much, Yoshino. Really appreciate it. You you have Japanese background. Yoshino is a very Japanese name. Yeah, I'm a, a 100% American Japanese. I'm fourth generation. Oh, wow. And yeah, and you're you're also um you're Japanese and Chinese, is that yep, correct? Half and half. My mom is Japanese, born in Tokyo. My dad is uh, from Taiwan and his father moved from China, so he considers himself a full-blooded Chinese. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, th- I found it really interesting listening back to your podcast with Noah because I feel like me and you went through maybe some similar things growing up, you know, kind of being on the outside. Mm. Uh, I grew up in California, um, in San Jose, but I went to a lot of private schools and I kind of felt like I was somewhat the outsider, or like, you know, one of a couple of Asian people in class. Yeah, it's... You know, the being born an Asian American, that's definitely a unique path. And I think most Asian Americans have this kind of drive to be something spectacular because we're sort of, we were competing with the big white guys in everything, you know, sports and, you know, and mostly in the U.S., sports is what determines you know, how popular you are in school. And so we all wanted to be athletes, but if we couldn't be athletes, then we try to be the smartest kid or whatever it is. I mean, maybe that was just me, but yeah, I think a lot of Asian Americans, especially men have this kind of low self-esteem because of the, the way media portrays us. And I think, you know, it's not, it's not like the most important, biggest life-changing issue for on the global scale, but for I think in our lives, it really affects how we see ourselves and how we think we have to be in the world. Yeah, I mean, I I think it definitely shapes our reality. And yeah, and I mean, sports are such a primal thing. And, uh, you know, I partaked in, well, I mean, I still do, but I've been a martial artist since since my early 20s. But I think with martial arts, there's a certain oneness or there's a certain sense of ownership to instead of doing like a team sport, for instance, you know, so you feel more connected to your journey. Definitely. And it's also a generational thing too. So, you know, if your parents are first generation, whether that if you're an Asian American or, you know, uh, another ethnicity, but the idea of having first generation parents coming here and trying to make a life for themselves, there's certain struggles, you know, Totally. Yeah, that they have to go through, which also shapes your reality. Oh, my God. I mean, yeah, seeing my parents struggle with money. And, you know, we weren't ever really poor. We always had food and a shelter. But, you know, the system just pulls people in. And the some, you know, some heart-centered, just sort of naive people just get pulled into the system and then spit out. So I saw my parents struggling with money. So from a young age, I was sort of a driven kid just always being an entrepreneur finding opportunities to sell things and it really affected you know my my mind and the way i saw my role because as children we feel a sense of sort of responsibility for our parents happiness and i always thought if i could bring in enough money you know they'd be happy (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. did you I mean, early on, did you feel a certain need to um, to really put yourself in a position where you would educate yourself or or, or did you feel I'm sorry, did you feel a certain pressure from your parents mm-hmm. to uh, rely a lot on education to push you um, forward? never pressure from my parents, really. I mean, my mom was pretty lax. My dad was pretty lax. Um, I think he only made one call to a teacher in like uh, when I was in eighth grade when I got a C on a paper. He's like, wait, he's a huge Australia kid. What happened to the C? Um, <laughs> yeah. But beyond that, no, they they actually had the opportunity to ha- to have me like skip a grade in my early elementary years, but they decided against that because – of various reasons, you know, they didn't want me to feel like out of place or, you know, smaller than the other people. So, I mean, I was always a very, I think, bright child. I was all in all the advanced enrichment, whatever, AP honors classes. I always put pressure on myself because I always wanted to be the best. 
And so I was extremely hard on myself. And in high school, I graduated, you know, sixth out of 437. And I was, but I was still the, wow. I was still the lazy, I was still the lazy smart kid in that group. And, you know, everybody else was quite um, diligent. And actually, in my high school, there were maybe, in my high school class, there were maybe five, six Asian kids. Um, and top in the top six, there were three Asians. And the top two were both Asian women, girls. So there's mm. something to Asian Americans. I don't know. I don't think it's necessarily in our genetics, but I think part of the whole immigrant coming over, having immigrants as parents, I mean, they really, you can see how hard they work as uh, parents and how hard they struggle. So you think I have to work hard. I think it just sort of in our blood to uh, somehow drive to be whatever, intelligent mm -hmm. or have good grades or something. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that lazy, smart thing that you're talking about, do you think that's because, you know, you had maybe an early perspective on the system that you were playing into and you were naturally gifted. Uh, oh yeah. And, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I was always, I was always gifted at trying to do the least amount of work and getting that a, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but still I was also, you know, if I got like a 95 on a test, it was okay. But I was, I would immediately look at the questions I missed. I wouldn't, I would, it was so, um, ingrained in me that I should be getting a hundred percent every time, you know, even when I got a 98, it was like, okay, which one did I miss? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? So yeah, yeah I was always, yeah, I, I was, I think when I was starting to be, I think uh sophomore, junior in high school, I really started rebelling against the system. I really saw how, you know, it was just a system. And then I started cheating in school and any, just, I was getting straight A's and I was like making cheat sheets for like vocabulary tests. So like this is how sort of, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just, I was sort of, um, I was sort of like a sneaky kid, you know, just not intelligent intellectually, but maybe a little too intelligent because then I try to do the least amount of work instead of really valuing the studying part. Cause you know, I like people, I liked having fun. I liked friends and, um, but also I was always a gamer and I always liked winning and I always liked finding ways around or finding the biggest shortcut or something. You know, what's really, really interesting about that, that, you know, I was just thinking about gaming in that aspect and how games play into the way that your early thought developments or how your early thoughts are developed because uh, I'm not, okay. So me and you are roughly around the same age. Did you ever use this device called the Game Genie? Game Genie? No. So it's it's basically this device. So when I was five, I got a Sega Genesis. Okay. And yes. I remember specifically about using this thing. It's this device called the Game Genie. Oh, and what you do, it's, a, it's another card. Is that the codes and the cracks and stuff, the cheats? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I swear this has a point, but I realize that I was just thinking about that device recently and I was thinking about how that kind of changed my thought pattern on mm -hmm. gaming because it made things a little bit easier and that actually had significant, uh, significant, uh, what's it called? It had like a significant, uh, change in the way that I feel like my brain started developing from mm -hmm. that because I found that I can utilize this device and it'll essentially make the game easier. But in turn, it also, uh, do doing things the easy way is not always the good way. Oh, for sure. It. Yeah. It really, yeah. The whole spiritual path is definitely not the easy way. So <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. the whole growing as a person takes facing challenges and life, life doesn't care if you knew how to cheat at a game. Uh, yeah. You have to, you have to put in the work usually if you want to make money in an honest way, you know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I guess, you know, going back to gaming a little bit, but how did, how do you think gaming uh, kind of plays into that idea of cheating and that idea of um, just making things easier for you? Yeah, I mean, I became really good at poker. I mean, 
not really good. But when I was 16, I started playing a lot of poker, online poker and poker in person. I was always organizing these small poker games. And by 17, I was going to the casinos illegally. And um, yeah, it's like that kind of, you know, the the whole money system, I, I saw it as a game sort of. And yeah, you know, poker poker has a very dark aspect to it. And there's a lot of bluffing and putting on a face and a perceived image and thinking about how other people perceive me and you know, thinking about how other person thinks that I perceive him. So there's a lot of layers of deception. And I was good at that. And, you know, all throughout my 20s, several times, I went back to that as sort of a fallback for easy money. But yeah, it, you know, making money and being good at the game, it doesn't really lead to happiness. I mean, treating life as a game doesn't really lead to happiness. You know, it's, it's really, it's really not something we can really figure out. It's like something we just have to dissolve into, you know, whatever it is life is, we just have to lose ourselves in it because yeah, we're, we're going to die and we're going to lose ourselves in the end anyway. So might as well start practicing uh, the dissolving process now. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's interesting. You say that. Cause uh, yeah, I'd like to hear more about your thoughts on the idea of, looking at life as a game because sometimes i think about that you know it's like i think about that there's these puzzles that need to be figured out in life and maybe that's kind of the wrong way to approach it and maybe it's more about i mean you know talking about psilocybin mushrooms it's you're intaking these mushrooms and they're literally you're digesting it and it's moving through you and it shows you things and it opens you up to certain things and then it's like how much you know you kind of have to relinquish control Mm -hmm. of your preconceived notions of and your ego and who you are and who you thought you were Mm -hmm. so but you know a lot of these times i i feel that and especially recently that i kind of feel a sense of nihilism in a way that nothing matters but then at the end i come to the conclusion that everything matters Mm -hmm. so it's kind of this strange like paradoxical experience i guess what i'm trying to get at is like what is your view on on that in terms of game theory Mm -hmm. and uh and just relinquishing control yeah i think you know like if we're looking at a numbers and a bank account it really is like uh how do i if if the idea is how do i make it grow then it can be sort of treated as a game and you know it's it's if you want to build an e-commerce site it's about how to get people to click a button to give you money and so it is sort of like a game and also it's not the biggest game in town like the biggest game in town is just dissolving into the the unknown and it's i mean it's it's There's no player in it. There's just the game and the idea is to realize that it's all just the thing. And yeah, it's like, it's like letting go of the player function. It's letting go of that first person point of view. It's letting go of that kind of idea that we are the center and we make the decisions. It's realizing that life moves through us and healing moves through us and the mushrooms move through us and they act in the ways they want to act. And my whole life is dedicated and surrendered to the mushroom spirit. So, I mean, in my life, I really don't feel like a human being. A lot of times I feel like I'm just the vessel for the mushroom spirit to move through. And this is a huge shift in my life because, you know, I've always been really narcissistic, self-centered. And after the mushrooms came in, it was like, it completely blew that out of the water. And yeah, now I pray a lot and I, I really bless and I appreciate. And it's really about feeling that compassion for people and, and, and just resting in peace and joy and sharing the truth and really seeing how deep imagination go, can go and how infinite imagination actually is 
when we really just let go of ourselves, when we just get out the way of our no, I can't, or uh, I don't think so. Like, why not just let the thought manifest itself, right? The thought is there. Like, why not just move out the way and just see what happens when we just let that thought move into reality? Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm really curious about your journey into magic mushrooms and psychedelics. And can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, most of my 20s was in and out of silent meditation retreats. I went to Burma a couple of times to sit with um, Urpandita Sayadaw, who is Mah Mahasi Sayadaw's direct um, spiritual descendant. And yeah, by the time, you know, I came in contact with him, he was already 92, 91 or 92, had all these health issues, but was still as steady and as peaceful of a rock as, as you can get. And yeah, he was a teacher that introduced Vipassana to a lot of the Western world. A lot of the teachers now, like Joseph Goldstein, Jack Cornfield, he had he played a big role in 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 helping them, you know, get into the spiritual life. And just being around those spiritual masters, man, that's something I wish for everybody to experience because then we really see what the big game in life is. And these masters have it figured out. I mean, these guys have been meditating for 40, 50, 60 years. I mean, they are just joyful and peaceful. And they are so, they just radiate pure compassion and love. And there's so much light coming from their being. And so that, that played a big role in shedding a lot of layers. I spent maybe about 16 months or a little more in and out of retreat. And it was, it was amazing. And yet I was still, you know, the spiritual path is definitely a lifelong journey. And I was still searching by the time I was 27, 28, I was still searching, still unsatisfied, still falling back on old habits. And so I had to, I, there was nothing else. And I just, the psychedelics started calling and I, I had rejected them for so long, but then I tried five tabs of LSD once in San Francisco and that completely blew my mind. And then the mushrooms started calling and for the last mm, a little more than two years, it's just been purely mushrooms. And yeah, the more I listened to their call, the more I just, just give up, you know, really it's about giving up the search for happiness and, giving in to that which is greater and just realizing that I'm just a small node in the whole network. And my role is to support the whole network and to, to give myself and my talents and my resources to the whole. And yeah, a lot of that generosity, I'm really happy and, and grateful for my, all my masters because the number one criteria or the number one foundational, mm, mm -hmm. let's say, um, uh, blessing to develop or trait to develop is this generosity. It's called a parami. And a parami is yeah. something that you have to keep putting. It's like a, it's like a big water jug that you just keep putting drops of water in and it starts filling up. And more and more, the more we're generous, the more just life just responds because life responds to those who serve life. And yeah, my master's taught me that. And so, yeah, now, you know, everything I have is given to the mushroom and the divine. And yeah, it's scary and it's exciting. I mean, we grew from three people at on New Year's Eve to now we're, we're about 13 people now. And so it's about been about two months and 10 days and we've gone from three to 13. And we have people wow. coming from all over the world to experience the retreats and come get involved. I mean, a lot of corporate dropouts, a lot of people who are seeking for purpose and want to um, get involved in something. So, yeah, it's beautiful to see the transformation. And, um, yeah, it's beautiful Incredible. to see. Yeah, it's beautiful to see how the mushroom just blossoms in, in human yeah. society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm. so I'm also curious about your 
experiences when you first started getting opened up um, with that first psychedelic experience with acid, but then it led you to more, um, more experiences with doing mushrooms. Mm -hmm. If, you know, that sort of, um, you know, falling back into bad habits and those sort of things is, do you think it's because the mushrooms and the psychedelics were opening, opening, oh, sorry, <laughs> opening you up to, um, an opening of your mind up to releasing the ego and to be able to just experience and mm -hmm. rather than feel, uh, the need to, uh, I guess, fabricate an experience, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Well, in the whole Buddhist tradition, which I sincerely 100% have faith in, there's the idea of karma and the cyclical nature of life. And addictions are sort of like that. We just, it takes us a long time to learn usually. And we sort of, we, we learn for a few months or a few years, and then we go back into it. And then we learn again. And every time we go back into it, it's usually less intense. We don't, we see less happiness in it and we get, we can get out of it earlier. Um, so, I mean, for me, like poker was sort of like that and internet addiction and, you know, all kinds of things like pornography, just wasting time playing games, you know, um, and I think the mushroom just hastens the ripening of karma. And yeah, you know, I had one more run to go with poker clearly in my karmic, uh, in my karmic seeds and that took place. But after that, it was just purely, I was now I'm just so, I feel like I have a pure purpose now and I'm not searching for anything. And it, there's a sense of happiness and joy that just radiates and, it's just such a blessing to have a purpose. And I, I wish for everybody to find their purpose in life and to find the something that we can just give ourselves to because that's really what purpose is. It's not about me. It's about that which is greater than ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's interesting. Uh, when I was listening to your podcast with Noah, um, Noah Lampert, uh, synchronicity, uh, for those that are listening out there, but, um, yeah, you know, I think it's so true about that idea of purpose, but also with that idea of purpose, I think we have to think about the reasons why we're doing that specific thing as well. Mm -hmm. And I, and I thought it was interesting that, you know, you're talking about a lot of people that take your retreats, uh, I think you were, you were saying something to the effect that generally um, there's a lot of people, I mean, like you said before, um, sort of corporate dropouts and people mm -hmm. who are trying to re-examine life and trying to re-examine the sort of meaning. Mm -hmm. And um, that idea of, of why and why you're contributing to something I think is so important as well. And then that helps structure the purpose, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, totally. It's, it's really about, I mean, it's really about being open and flexible with the purpose too. It's not like I have an idea in my head of what the purpose is. I really, it's about responding to what comes in life and who shows up and then serving people becomes a purpose. Like whoever shows up, I want to be of service. Like, how can I help you? And yeah, it's, I see it a lot in these these people who have been successful or moderately successful, at least in the corporate world, they have money, they have had, you know, some kind of status and they've had respect, but it just, it, they just feel empty and they're, they need something bigger than just themselves and their bank account. And so, yeah, there's a lot of times I just sense this, there's a sense of desperation of finding something they're passionate about. Because people with business skills and technology skills, I mean, usually, you know, people offer money for their souls, basically. So it's, mm -hmm. um, it's exactly. really, and I think artists like you, I mean, you want to keep your soul. And that's why sometimes um, artists don't tend to do well sometimes economically because their soul isn't for sale. And so nobody is offering money for their soul. 
you know, whereas, <laughs> whereas a computer software engineer, I mean, you know, even though he's still sort of like an artist type, I mean, he's a creative type. I mean, if someone offers you half a million a year to solve a few problems, I mean, it's really difficult to turn down, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's this kind of, it's like a, it's like a mix, mixed blessing to have these kind of business skills is, you know, where, how are you going to implement those? Who are you going to give those business skills to? How are you going to be, you know, who, how are you going to be put to use? Is it going to be for corporate interests or is it going to be for divine interests? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I was also thinking about that idea of purpose in terms of art. And I was having a conversation recently with one of my friends who's a painter and he was telling me about the story of Chuck Close. Uh, Chuck Close is this uh, really big uh, blue chip artist, uh, very popular in tons of museums. And he was saying that someone asked him the question of, uh, if there was no one else in the in the world, would you still do art? Which kind of you know opens you up to the idea of okay, so what is the actual purpose of doing art? Mm-hmm. Is it that I'm trying to satisfy my own ego? Is it because I want the attention of other people? And I think in that particular instance, he was you know he was thinking Chuck was thinking more about certain practical things. You know, it's like, well, of course I wouldn't do art because I would be more concerned about where I would get food and, you know, how, where I would get water and those sort of things, um, which I guess is another paradox. But, uh, you know, I think about that too, in terms of the realization of, okay, so what does this actually mean? You know, what does, what does doing art actually mean to me? Uh, and, and also just, uh, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is psilocybin mushrooms really open you up to questioning your own reality. Mm-hmm. And I think it's interesting what you're talking about, about the idea of narcissism and trying to relinquish that mm-hmm. and just open yourself up more to this sort of connection. And that gives you a sort of sense of purpose, mm-hmm. which led you to creating uh, truffles therapy. Is that correct? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think anything that is self-focused that, that refers to the self is bound to, um, not bring any happiness because the personal body and mind and my name and my reputation, it's all come and go, you know, we're just, we're just little specks of dust in the big thing. So, I think it's really giving to the big thing, whatever it is. And, and, and just surrender. It's, it's really the idea of surrender. It's really the idea of having faith in that, which is greater than the body and mind and just finding ways to serve that. However way that looks, it could be, you know, volunteering at a homeless shelter. It could be, uh, you know, um, we know this vegan artist who just makes art about save the animals and um, she makes all our logos, which is really beautiful. And, you know, it could also be just making uh, like yoga mats or yoga blocks, like handmade furniture that just brings joy in people's lives. It could be anything. As long as it's not about me, it it can bring some sort of satisfaction, I think. Yeah. Where do you think um, that sort of that idea of relinquishing control and surrender, do you remember a point of realization when that, uh, when you really realize that that is something that you need to do in order to uh, achieve a sort of sense of higher self or, or sorry, not higher sense of self, but um Sorry that that was a little it was a little convoluted that, that that question. I guess what I'm trying to say is, when was that point when you realized uh, that moment that you should surrender? Well, it's a continual pro- process. I I was in retreat for in and out for many 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 years. I mean, I did some longer retreats, you know, two, three, four months. Wait, did I do four months? No, maybe maybe three. No, maybe I did do four months, actually. 
Um, but yeah, in those retreats, it's just so obvious over and over every day. It's like, okay, right. It's letting go of control, letting go of control, right? But our sense of self and our conditioned mind just it needs the control it's so scary to let go of control because then we realize we don't know anything and the whole mind structure relies on thinking it knows something and holding on to ideas and words and who i am so the surrendering of control just comes it comes naturally when we're on the spiritual path and we realize that it's not working my way like i cannot force myself to grow spiritually it just yeah. has to be this sort of grace or it really just has to be this kind of opening that happens when we just give up basically and that's what whole zen koan is about is the master gives the student these kind of phrases or questions to mull over and they're nonsensical questions like what's the sound of one one hand clapping or if a tree fall, falls in a forest and there's no one around, does it make a sound? Things like don't really make sense to the rational mind. And the job of the student is to focus on it so much, think about nothing else, until he has a mental breakdown where he realizes that the small mind can't figure out how life works and what the problem is and what the question or the answer is and that the, actually there is no answer. And at that point, that mental breakdown is the surrender. It's just giving up the mental, intellectual, trying to figure things out. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of questioning your idea of logical reasoning. Yes. Yeah, exactly. In, there in is the human perspective. Oh, yeah. The human logic, you know, it, look at look at our environment now. I mean, this is what logic has led to. So our logic isn't very good, basically. <laughs> yeah, exa yeah, exactly. So then, I mean, breaking this down a little bit further. So then what is your, uh, I guess, how, how do you think about the idea of time? Well, I mean... You know, on the journeys, on um, especially the high dose journeys, we realize time, it just really doesn't exist. Like we're just running. Yeah, we're running into whatever we're just in whatever it is. And whatever it is, is totally infinite and eternal without bounds. Yeah. And so okay. the, the whole time, the linear thinking of past, present, future, that's all just man-made basically that's all just conditioned and now more than ever because of this whole future oriented achievement oriented progress technology getting better improving all the time this is pure conditioning it has nothing to do with actual infinite ultimate reality so i think it's just the more we let go of this idea that there's a past and future and the more we realize that that it's just a blossoming of a flower or it's like a caterpillar coming out of, or it's a, it's a butterfly coming out of a caterpillar. The more we realize that, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm time is different for everybody. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I guess why I asked that is because uh, at least, you know, just the way that I've structured my mind and the way that I've structured things, it's, you know, I'm very conscious of time and utilizing that time. And I'm not quite sure. And I mean, yes. And I think, you know, when you're on, um, when you're doing psilocybin mushrooms, you just relinquish sort of the essence of time. Mm -hmm. You can feel like 10 hours have passed and you look at the clock and there's only 30 minutes have passed but you're really feeling and engaging with that specific moment. And then I think directly after that, at least for me, I can only speak from my perspective and my recent perspectives is that that essence of time, I have to re question that essence of time and how, and, and, and try to figure it out. <clears throat> Which is why I'm asking you why what your perspective of time is now, you know? Yeah, it's 
it's really just diving into the heart. Then we realize what what we actually think time is, is just all mental stuff. The heart is just pure and it's infinite. And there doesn't, there is no beginning and end. It's just all one big thing that might not actually be anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know what? And I, I found that really interesting that like I was just looking at your bio and you wrote down this uh, Terrence McKenna quote and I'll, I'll just read it really quick, but psychedelics are illegal, not because a loving government is concerned that you may jump out of a third story window. Psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally laid down models of behavior and information processing. Mm -hmm. They open you up to the possibility that everything you know is wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going into that quote, you know, I guess what I'm trying to equate is you're talking about falling back into old patterns and those sort of things, because I think your mind is starting to break down these structures that we've made into our sort of weird, you know, nonsensical nonsensical logical reality when really there's no logic it's just it's it just it is what it is and it functions how it is yeah i mean it does have a logic of its own like seasons you know i'm in amsterdam and there's clearly four seasons and the logic is that you know animals don't go running around and partying in winter time um and they come out in spring and they're happy and they're bright at least they, you don't know if they do eat. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're having their own sort of parties that's right that's right i mean the logic of nature is so it's so present you know it's animals get up in the morning and they start looking for food because you have to eat and you don't stop working or looking for food until you can you can uh, you have your fill for the day and then the next day it's the same thing so humans is also like that if we really break it down we're all working because we want good food to eat and we want uh to be able to be safe and shelter i mean at the very core that is the reason um now there are people who somehow can once we have those basics figure out then we can start questioning like what's my purpose you know, a starving family in, in India or Africa is definitely not asking about purpose. It's asking about how can I get a cup of rice to to so I can live today. Exactly. Yeah. yeah but I, I also find it fascinating how people are the only species on this planet that question their purpose. Mm. Yeah. At least from what we know. I don't know. You know, maybe dolphins communicate in a certain way to where they are under understanding or trying to question the reason why they do things or their purpose. Mm -hmm. But from our knowledge and communication structures between other human beings, it just seems that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the the idea is that animals act more from instinct and that the human faculty for, uh, you know, developing the intellectual side is what makes us separate somehow and also it's also to question this right do i mean dolphins are probably way more intelligent in ways we can't imagine you know we can't swim however many kilometers an hour and communicate miles using sound right it's just it it's um every animal is intelligent in its own way like a a lion a lion pride is intelligent in catching zebras and learning how to be the kings of the the savanna you know mm -hmm. and and hyenas are intelligent in finding ways to work in packs to scare off lions um from 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 animals they might be eating so every animal is different and you know chimpanzees they they can swing from branch to branch it's definitely not something we humans can do so i think there's so many different types of intelligence and Humans have been so good at this intellectual type, and but we've also lost a lot of other types. Like you see a lot of people, they're completely unhealthy. You know, they, they might be learning how to eat and make a living and be comfortable. But 
I mean, they're fat and they might not be so intelligent in terms of health or spiritual practice, you mm-hmm. know, or, or people who research for years before they dive into psychedelics, like, are they really intelligent or are they just scared? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, is it, yeah. I mean, the, probably intelligence would be like just trying it yourself and seeing what happens. That's real courage, right? Maybe, maybe it's not so intelligent just to read stuff. Maybe the intellect is actually keeping people from true emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. I think, yeah, I think there's a certain balance between um, sort of, logical thought and um i mean you can only really pick up so much from books but you really have to go out there and experience certain things for yourself i mean you can read 500 books on traveling but not travel a day in your life Mm -hmm. you know but I, i i also wonder if that's just the way i mean it's a it's a couple things but I think it does come back down to the reasonings for why people do that. Cause you know, maybe it's good enough for someone to just um, read about something and then they develop this sort of story in their mind, which is also, you know, where potentially good writing can come from. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like a rich human experience also you have to have these experiences, which means that you go out and you do things and you experience and you smell and you invigorate your senses. So, um, yeah, there, we are nature and it's remembering that we are not separate from nature and being in front of the computer, the phone, it's okay because that's really necessary for most types of work, but also, there's something bigger than just Instagram and Facebook and watching cat videos on YouTube. There's something (laughs) way vaster than just what my eyes can see. And there's something so divine in space and silence and the way trees are and real how animals just function in their in their way, just based on how life actually works on this planet and how millions of years of evolution in just animal species have just led to to us now. And to also realize that the mushrooms have been on this planet for 1.2 billion years and they are the oldest kingdom compared to human beings who have been on this planet for 200,000. And so it's really learning from species, our real ancestors, our elders, and really respecting the stories and the visions and the horrors and the destruction and the happiness they've experienced and opening ourselves up to being taught by something that we thought used to be lower than us. Like I never paid attention to mushrooms. They were sort of this, just sort of this thing that existed, you know, when I was a child. But now I realize that mushrooms are basically support all life. I mean, all forests are supported by my mycelial networks underground and mycelium are pure networkers. They're pure intelligence. They know how to search for food. They know how to build kingdoms. And, you know, they're the longest survivors. When dinosaurs went extinct, mushrooms and fungi, um, they, they've survived. So they have so much compassion and love and light and so many visions they've seen they pass on to humans who are ready for them and it's humbling ourselves realizing that maybe everything i know is wrong maybe everything human society has taught me about what life is is maybe not so correct maybe it's just a limited view maybe the mushrooms are better teachers than than uh teachers that taught us math in school or something Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah hmm yeah, it's making me think. <laughs> I just, I just had visuals in my head about the mycelium networks and how it works, and uh, yeah, I they're think so intelligent. Of, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of complexities that we try to dissect that we really can't fathom. Mm. There's just certain things that we can't really truly understand. Uh, but 
we can try to understand it. I don't, I mean, no, yeah, it's that know. it really is that it's just questioning, just saying, I don't know. That's really the right answer to most everything. Like we literally don't even know why we're human beings. Like, why didn't we get reincarnated? <laughs> Why didn't we, yeah. we get reincarnated as a rabbit or an ant or a parasite or a lion or a bird? Like we literally have no answers to the, the most fundamental questions, right? If we don't know where we came from yeah. and what we're going to go back to after life, like how do we know anything on, on earth really? It's just questioning and really realizing that I don't know is the right answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally agree, man. <laughs> so, um, well, yeah, man, I guess uh, maybe to wrap, wrap it up a little bit, but um, yeah, do you, do you have any advice for artists, you know, whether it be, or artists and creatives, whether it be um, opening yourself up to things or, you know, what would oh, your definitely. advice be? Oh, man, just look into what the Buddha and Jesus taught. Look into your own heart, infinity, eternity. What is God? What is this thing that's been passed down? What is the divine? And just really pray for guidance. Let the art just channel through. You know, just really just get out the way. And Man, I mean, mushrooms. I mean, when artists really dive into the mushrooms and they put faith in the mushrooms, the mushrooms will completely support the artist because the mushrooms are the most intelligent species kingdom in the world. And especially psilocybin mushrooms, they might be one of, if not the most intelligent species in the entire world. So when they find someone who's helping them spread the word and who's helping them grow themselves and draw them and share them with people and share their love and peace. I mean, they're going to bring so many blessings into your life. And yeah, it's just like that. It's like really have faith in the ancient elders and they might not all be human beings. And yeah, just pray. Just our soul needs to, our spirit just needs to be getting on the ground every day with our knees and just praying and being humble praying for humility, praying for self-love, praying for for love for the world and peace and compassion and praying for people and wanting people to be happy. And, and that just brings joy and, and gratitude into our lives. And that humility is what people recognize. And, and nature recognizes humility and it supports humility. Thank you so much, man. Where yeah. can people find... Uh, your company truffles therapy and learn more about the retreats that you hold. So our website is truffles therapy.com T R U F F L E S therapy.com. And on there, there's most of the information and yeah, we, we hope to see some people soon. I mean, we love working with artists because they're really, the most heart centered and we just we really if money weren't an issue i mean we just give out these retreats for free you know that's our long term vision is to be able to put on by donation psychedelic um uh, retreats and have other businesses just supporting this aspect and yeah let's it's about linking hands like you you're working in a collective and it's linking hands all working together towards a big thing like just really putting our own personalities and status, like just be a nobody, you know, that's what I want to say. I mean, really fame yeah. has real no benefit to the spiritual life. It can only be a hindrance and just stay humble. Just make sure you have enough to eat, serve other people, you know, really create from the spirit, create from the channeling, create from the empty space. Let that space manifest itself in, in its visions and, just be a channel, like really don't try to be anybody, just be a channel for the love and the light to shine through, through your art. And, um, yeah, like, yeah, it's truffles therapy and I, and, and, uh, we hope to see some of you soon. And also, you know, yeah. we, we encourage everyone to find, um, other legal ways to consume these things and, Find ways to get in touch with the medicine and, and heed its calling. Listen to its calling and just 
surrender and uh, the mushrooms and the psychedelics will just shower infinite blessings on your lives. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you coming on and, and giving us a little bit of insight. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yoshino. All right. Thank you. Hey, I'm just going to stop the recording right now.